Hi. Um, I really want to thank Lisa for inviting me to both have the exhibition and also um, have me here, host me to do this lecture for you all. And also to see the show in person is a real delight for me, living all the way in Albuquerque. Um, I'm not going to lie, I always like to visit the Bay Area, so this was a really great opportunity just to check in with some friends and be here for that. And um, I'm just excited to, you know, talk to you and and get to know the Sierra College a little bit. Um, so you have a beautiful campus, and I'm very pleased um, to be able to check it out. So um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 40 minutes is me. <laughs> I'm an artist, um, <laughs> and I make work about identity. Um, so I'm going to talk about me, but I wanted to frame my work as a trajectory. So I didn't want to just focus on the work that's in um, the gallery uh, to give you some, a little bit of um, context. That work was a body of work that lasted about nine years, um, 10 years, maybe 11 actually. I, don't, I mean, I just can't keep track, but it, it was my first body of work. So I made that work um, right in undergrad. I started that. So maybe possibly around the time that you all are entering your art, um, interests, uh, scholarship, and art making. Um, that's about the time I started that project. I'm going to talk a little bit about what led me through and kept momentum through the project, and then how I transitioned to some different, what felt like really different bodies of work that now looking back, I'm able to show you this framework for how they really make sense together and how they feed off of each other. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start in, chrono I'm going to do chronological order. Um, and this is an image that um, I think is most associated with that first body of work. Um, it's a large format piece that I photographed with a 4x5 camera. So if you're not familiar, it's like one of those ones that has like the bellows that extends, you know, the accordion bellows, and, um, and it takes large sheet film. This image alone took me, I would, I would probably, I think I've estimated it took me about three years to make. <laughs> not every day, you know, <laughs> but um, it took several trips back from the Bay Area where I was getting my uh, master's at California College of the Arts. I would fly back to where my family still lived in upstate New York and I would make, <coughs> make images. Um, and I started with 35 millimeter format and then I moved into the larger format, medium format and then larger format. So I used all kinds of different cameras for this process. So that's what you're looking at right now. It's probably my favorite image that I've ever taken in my life, which is a really scary thing because then you wonder, are you ever gonna take another favorite image? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I'm an artist, but I'm also an educator. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm a lecturer at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, and I do a lot of traveling uh, for my work as an educator and also uh, for my work as an artist. The work I'm most interested in making typically uses photography as a means to pull apart and examine my very personal life experiences. Um, I really bear a lot of my personal life. I put it out there. I'm making myself very vulnerable, which is part, I think, part of the attraction that sometimes people can have to the work. But also, on the other side, it can be something that really can feel very um, alienating or distancing for some people. Um, so I accept all of that. Um, I like to question where truth and fiction meet in this process. And so for me, this, is, um, this holds one truth for me. But um, in another use of this image, it might hold a very different truth for someone else. Um, when it was exhibited at the Oakland um, International Airport, um, it was almost pulled because people were very nervous in the airport about a woman with a gun being pictured in the airport. I don't get that. but some other people have those feelings. So part of my responsibility as an artist in, in making this work has a lot to do with that um, line of where my responsibility is to my viewer and where my responsibility is to my subject, which is often myself, and my own um, experience and interest in developing a body of work, right? I'm committed to my research. So I consider my artwork my research. So in order to give some context to my current work and just the trajectory, like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about catastrophe, crisis, and other family traditions. This is a title I came up with in grad school, um, and it's a very dramatic title. And I was a very tormented, dramatic 20-year-old when I came up with that title, 21-year-old. Um, in this 10-year project about my family, um, hopefully you've had a chance to see the exhibition in Ridley Gallery. And if you haven't, I hope that after seeing this lecture, maybe you'll go wander over there and take a look. And you can really see in the installation is like a really good way to see it. 
um, in the context of the installation, but also I have a book that's a monograph that um, is an unpublished monograph. So it's kind of a special opportunity for you to take a look through that. Um, but much of what's in that book I'm going to talk about here. So um, I grew up uh, with my family on a small farm in upstate New York, a very rural part of upstate New York. And if you're not familiar with upstate New York, it has nothing really to do with New York, Manhattan. <laughs> it's a very different world. So they're in the same state, but New York City is actually, it's like saying LA is all of California. Mm, no, it's not. Um, so uh, I was really um, growing up in not a very urban atmosphere at all. I grew up in uh, a rural place and I actually grew up in ex some extreme poverty circumstances. Um, so I actually wanted to approach this project from a very documentary point of view. Um, and my motivation was for the beginning that I was a photographer. I was studying um, documentary photography, and commercial photography at Rochester Institute of Technology, which is about an hour from where my family lives. Um, I wanted to photograph this very interesting subject. So examine that how you like in, you know, from a psychological perspective, but um, which believe me, I have. Um, but really what I was trying to do is remove myself and look at it and treat the, the subject, my family, as a subject. And I think there was a lot of fruitful understanding and learning that happened through that process, but it was also a very painful process. And as you can imagine, imagine if you did that with your own family, it would cause a lot of alienation and, and, and difficulty in communication. Um, so crisis after crisis seemed to be happening after my father left my family. Um, I was about 12 years old. I'm not going to go into all of the details of this story because I don't think it's entirely um, important to understanding why the motivation behind the work, but I do want to give you a little bit of this biographical understanding because I also think it helps inform the more recent work about identity theft. Um, so some, uh, some of these crises that were occurring after my father left the family, so we were living in upstate New York, my father came out of the closet, moved out to San Francisco, and um, to, we'll talk about that later, but um, moved out to San Francisco um, and left my family um, destitute. So we ended up having our house foreclosed upon us. I grew up in that time before my dad left, a little lower middle class, middle class, and then immediately, and you know how fast that can happen. I'm sure you've seen stories or experienced it yourself. One event in your life can really change the course of your whole world and how your quality of life is. Um, for better or for worse, you know, winning the lottery is probably one of the, <laughs> the things you think of, but also, you know, losing your job or, um, what, you know, whatever you can think of. So for us, it was my father leaving and um, not making payments on the house and the car and things like that. So there was this long series of crises and catastrophes that were happening. Um, we were evicted from our rental home. Once our house was foreclosed, we were evicted from our rental home. Um, we ended up being homeless for about a year and then finally settled into this trailer in the woods in um, upstate New York on some land that my grandfather gave us. Um, we didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity um, for a lot of that time. And this is all through my teen years. So I had like my sweet 16 during this transition. It was not very sweet 16, but um, the, the good thing was that this rural community that we were settling into, there was a lot of poverty. I know that sounds strange, but people got us, like people understood. It wasn't as if we were like sticking out or anything. We were one of, you know, the community of people who were struggling. So after an intense struggle with my mother and sisters uh, at the end of high school, I did make a decision to go to college. Um, and in that decision, I ended up deciding that I was going to study art. So I went for chemistry and that first semester decided that was not going to work for me. Um, and then I turned to photography, which is something that I really connected with in, in high school. And so I started making these images that were really about my home and about this disdain I felt for this background that I saw as being a struggle. And my goal in, in going to college, and maybe some of you can um, connect with this, uh, was to move up in class. I didn't want to be in that class anymore. I didn't want to you know, have the struggles that, that my community was struggling with. And so I wanted to remove myself from that and become someone of importance, become someone who was accomplished in a field. And I chose the field of photography. So um, that year I moved away to college my freshman year. Um, I had to take a leave of absence at the end of the year because my brother, um, who was adopted, by the way, um, 
was injured in a severe fire accident. Um, and this project really came from a need to deal with that struggle that first, you know, that first kind of emerged in college where um, I thought of him as sort of like a son in a way and I had left him behind and there was all kinds of issues with my mother not being um, really able to be a mother at times, um, though we are fair, fairly resolved at this time. But so I was experiencing a lot of um, guilt around leaving. So I kept moving, uh, going back. So I would go back and forth between college and home, and I would um, photograph my family. Um, because I had ass assignments, right? I was in college for photography. I had assignments. And every assignment I would make into a project of my family. So my first color assignment um, I was given was just photograph what you think of as a good color photograph. It was like the most banal general assignment ever. Um, but these were the images I came back with. And so while my colleagues and my peers as sophomore or maybe juniors were um, bringing in pictures of stop signs and really cool stuff that was like abstract or whatever, and then they're like, boom, the downer, Debbie Downer has to like bring this like scarred up little Korean adoptee into the mix. Um, so that actually for me was very empowering, that moment where my teacher acknowledged these are very powerful photographs. It resonated with me and immediately um, set me on a path that thought, maybe there's value here. Maybe I should look at this. Not in the sense that I might share them publicly, but look at it like maybe I could take some photographs that would be beautiful even um, in a, finding beauty in things that were ugly, finding beauty in things that were difficult. And so that was really my first, and that's still like my passion, is finding the beauty in the everyday, finding the beauty in things that are really hard to deal with. And I think art is a really important place that we as humans do that. This is a perfect example of that. Um, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis um, when I was finishing up college and she lost the use of her legs. Um, so I declared um, my major in photography, uh, like I said, and then I continued to document life. So this is me um, on a trip home. So I'm working full time at school, or maybe like quarter, to, uh, three quarters time at school as a lab manager. Um, I'm taking 18 units most semesters, um, and then I'm also driving back and forth, commuting to take care of my siblings who are all younger than me while my mom is in a nursing home. So I'm going back and forth. I'm really struggling. It's just kind of, you know when things are crazy and you're like, oh, this is just my normal? Like this is just like, you kind of just go into survival mode and you're like, oh, doesn't everyone, you know, you don't think everyone's like that, but you do kind of get a sense that I just need to get through this. And so this is a moment where my mom was being um, driven away in an ambulance for the 17th time in about a month. And um, I had my Holga camera, which is a little plastic camera, and I snapped a photograph of my crying. And I did, I, I mean, it was angsty, it was a moment of angst and emotion, but it also, it was a witness. It was a way to witness and, me and have a mirror to myself and say, this is an important thing that's happening right now. And this is a way I can document and maybe later understand it, which I did. Um, through the book, through the making of the book, I started to realize that I needed to take more self-portraits. I needed to stop seeing my family as the other and recognize that I was part of that. So instead of seeing them as these sort of like subjects, which they were, I started to enter into the frame. So I'm literally putting myself in the frame here as someone who is struggling with my weight, as someone who is struggling to pay my student loans, um, as someone who uh, is struggling to find my identity in between classes. Um, not classes like in school, but class like, you know, poverty, middle class. So as the project progressed, my interest turned much more towards examining myself and my evolving relationships with my family. Um, and it became really important that I, every trip home, recognized what part I was playing in my, in my role in the family. So, you know, in the icy snow of upstate New York, um, we're having our pipes freeze and, you know, we, we didn't have, the well wasn't running or, you know, the heat is shut off or whatever things were happening. I'm not there to, like, document and just be a witness. I'm there to, like, go to the graveyard and haul some water back, right? I'm there to take the trash out. I'm there to nurse the sick goat. I'm there to, you know, field the catastrophe. You know, that, that's sort of like a mode I would snap into. And then I was in the mode. And so this is me photographing myself in a very real and genuine mode while 
I have thought about this for six months before I made this image. So this was an image I had in my mind going back, hoping I would be able to capture it, maybe not exactly with all the details, but pretty much down to exactly the way the lighting is, exactly the time of day, all of those things. Um, I'm, I'm imagining, so it's somewhat staged in Tableau, but it's also based on very real experiences, which is also how the gun image came about. So again, more self-portraiture. And this is straight up like, how can I put myself in the framework of the signifiers? Like what are the signifiers of poverty? Um, some broke ass equipment in the front yard. Like that's a pretty straight up like, okay, now it's rural and now we like got tractors in the front yard that aren't working and whatever. So this was like my closest thing to that. And then throw in a like bleach bottle and you got it, you know, down. And so for me, that's what I was playing with. Is, so what are the signifiers? Why do people respond to this work? Why is, you know, my mentors were Larry Sultan and Jim Goldberg. These are people that are encouraging me to make this work. Why is that? What are they finding interesting in it? It's because it's exotic. It's because it's the other. It's because it's something that is unique. And so I was trying to embrace that while still remaining true and genuine. So there was a lot of dancing around that. What's real? And what's my injection of my own personality? So there are no photographs of my father in this first project. I decided not to directly address the absence of my father in this, this catastrophe, crisis, and other family traditions. Instead, I decided, and it was my decision, to let his absence just be a presence. To let, sometimes you know that negative space that we talk about in, in drawing and in painting, that negative space of the absence was able to just exist without me having to say, oh, and my father and all this crazy stuff. Um, so then, after this project needed to naturally come to a close, which is a complicated sort of uh, explanation that I won't really get into, but basically, um, I had graduated from, you know, I'd gotten my master's, I had made the book, um, I got my first tenure track position teaching uh, at a college, a community college in the Bay Area, and I was feeling like a little bit at peace. Like, hmm. Maybe my work there is done. And then also at the same time, oh my God, what if that's the only project I have in me? What if that's it? What if Mommy Was Gone is it? You know, and I had run this prestigious award, the Aperture Award. And, you know, I was, I was really like feeling at a high point with this work. But at the same time, everyone kept asking me whenever I would show the work, so what's next? So what are you doing next? So what's next on your plate? I didn't know that's what an artist needed to think. I, I was working on this work, right? I don't know what I'm going to work on next. So now I know what I'm working on next. That's a lesson I learned. But so I took some awkward time there in my um, early 30s, my late 20s, this transition from this one body of work that I had a fair amount of success from and then transitioning to some unknown territory that I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know what. So what now? That was all I wanted to explore, right? No, <laughs> incorrect. It was just the tip of the iceberg. So in 2008, Shortly after I completed my family project, I decided to try to find my father. I thought, well, what's he up to? Like, <laughs> I'm totally estranged from him for years and years. I know he lives somewhere near in the vicinity of the Bay Area. I'm not, I'm not in contact with him. I'm not connected with him. But I'm curious, what's he up to? Um, he and I had been estranged for over 10 years by this point. It was my choice to be estranged from him. Um, and I wanted to figure out if I could reach out to him. You know, maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe... I was ready to deal with you know, his absence in my life at a time. Maybe I could forgive. Maybe we could work on this. You know, He had suggested therapy and a number of other things. I had been through some therapy. I was like, yeah, this could work. So I did, naturally, what I think made sense to me, which was to go and find him, but without telling him. So um, I did. I did that. Um, so I went up to, and I, I actually have a big gap in I don't have like a ton of slides from this project, but you can look online. There's, there's plenty of stuff out there about this. But this is me with my shadow on his garage. So um, I would go up there to Walala was actually where I was going, which is um, one of my favorite places on the planet, actually. Uh, I think such a special, amazing place. So I would go on a little trip up there um, every so often. So I went up for Father's Day. I went up for New Year's. or you know, I would go up and I would tell my friends here back or back in Oakland, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to see my dad this weekend. And they're like, I thought you didn't talk to your dad. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see him. But 
Um, so I, I was really deliberate about, I found out where, you know, I did some Google searching, I found out where he lived, I went and confirmed, yes, in fact, that's where he lived. Um, okay, now what? You know, I didn't necessarily start it thinking it was an art project, but I started it more like, I just wanna know what he's doing. And I think in the earlier stages, I was just trying to gain some power where I felt like I had lost it, basically. So I think that's a, bear, a theme in a lot of my work is that I'm trying to gain power back from something that I felt like out of control from. And so, through photographing him um, repeatedly over about four years um, without him knowing, I did feel like I gained some power back. Um, but then once again, who's really the subject of this? Who do you think I figured out was really the subject of this work? Yeah, myself. And so I'm dressing in these blonde wigs and running around in camo and the, you know, all this like crazy stuff. I actually met a contractor for the military who voluntarily made me a bunch of missions. So he mapped out all these like missions and I was like, dude, I'm, this is for real now, you know? And so I showed up with my camo, uh, you know, hat here and I had my blonde wig on standby, you know, and I didn't use credit cards under his advice. I only paid in cash. I didn't speak to anyone. Um, I hid in the woods, I entered, you know, and of course I had to try the hardest missions first and almost fall off a cliff in the ocean and get, I was surrounded by baby skunks at one point in the middle of the night and freaking out, raccoons, you know. So I, I actually ended up feeling like I was performing in this elaborate performance for these animals in the woods and myself and I felt like a crazy person a little bit. And so I decided to just embrace that and be like, you know, who, who else to be a crazy person and do this work than an artist? And so that actually was a turning point, and I keep referring to therapy because it really is an important part of my practice, is self-reflection. So I met with my therapist and I was like, yeah, I'm going, to see my I'm going to see my dad. She's like, you're going to see your dad. I was like, well, I'm going to photograph him and explain what I was doing. And she's like, if you weren't an artist doing this, I would be really worried about you. And that was the moment I decided to make it an art project. I am not joking. Um, I really was. I was like, OK, so it's acceptable if I make it an art project. So um, I want to tell you, actually, that uh, I'm going back to this slide because it's a pretty important um, point, that um, my dad actually died in May 2012. And it was before I could ever come around to deciding to talk to him. So he died at a really interesting time. He was 60 years old. He was uh, very obese. He had an aneurysm. He had struggled with weight and with food issues his whole life, um, which is something that my whole family, you, you know, you saw, um, has some, some struggle with, for sure. Um, and he died about a month before my son, my son was born, my first and only son. And he also died a year after I was married. And I did not actually invite him to the wedding, um, which he was really upset by. So the reason I had any knowledge of what his mindset was is my sisters were actually in touch with him. So they were in touch with him before he died. After he died, my sister told me that he had, and she was close-ish with him, in fact, found out about this project. I, Pretty sure he found out because she told him, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and she said his response was that he was actually flattered. Of course, he's a narcissist. Of course, he's going to be flattered by his daughter stalking him and making a project out of it, um, which is kind of bothered me. I'm like, no, he's not supposed to be flattered. He's supposed to be scared and <laughs> like, wow, she's a badass. And, you know, I'm scared of her. Um, but when I began making the trips up there, I think I saw myself as this persecuted person and him as this sort of enemy. And I had this narrative. You know, we all have this narrative of our lives and the people we interact with that, you know, some of us are more based in reality than others and, you know, the, those other people. Um, and uh, I, I feel like I started the project just as a way to pursue, like, did he actually do the things that I thought he did? I was told and I... I experienced that he had been stalking me as a young person and that he had actually attempted to kidnap me. So that's a big part of what the motivation was in turning those tables. So it wasn't just, oh, I didn't have a dad after I was 12. Like it was more, it was more based in trauma than that. But with, I will say too, before I move on with this project, I did feel like um, it was very it was very personal in a way that the project about my family wasn't, if that makes sense. It was very much like, I don't need, I don't want to give everyone the information, like I'm telling you. The book is very clearly about my father. I, I didn't want it to look like it was a spurned lover or something that totally changes the tone of it and it's like way creepy. But with my dad, not that creepy, I'm his daughter, right? And so I wanted to bring up those questions. I say that in all seriousness, like, is that okay? You know, and so I'm asking my viewer, 
is this okay that I'm doing this? I'm looking for validation and also questioning. Is this okay, Jesse? Like checking in, you know? And so using it as almost like a mirror. You know, when you get dressed, you look in the mirror, you're like, is this okay? Does this, is this too, am I trying, oh no. You know, and so doing that kind of, um, having a conversation with myself. Um, Nan Golden has a body of work, a very well-known documentary, social, uh, personal documentary photographer. <coughs> Nan Golden has a body of work called I'll Be Your Mirror. And I really was inspired by that title and by that work. So my phone rings on the morning of February 6, 2011. Inspector Crudeau, totally not a made-up name, from the San Francisco Police Department Financial Crimes Unit starts asking me questions on the other end of, other end of the phone. Oh, uh-oh. Um, he informs me that this woman was arrested two days prior trying to check into Hotel Vitale, a very upscale hotel right on the Embarcadero. I couldn't afford to stay there. Um, she was caught trying to use my stolen New Mexico State driver's license as her own. So, flashback. In 2009, I had moved from the bustling, expensive Bay Area to the remote, dry, oh-so-dry desert of Albuquerque to start a new life. There's a lot of story there. I'm going to skip over. <laughs> um, personal stuff that didn't end up figuring into the artwork, but informed it. Um, on a trip back to the Bay Area that first year I was there, um, I was doing some art business with a gallery. So I was actually showing the body of work about my father in its first iteration. Um, someone stole my purse and my phone, my stuff, all of that, outside of the gallery's office, out of the curator's office where we had left it. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Sorry about that. Um, so it was a bummer. My stuff was stolen. I was kind of stranded a little bit. I had to like get new cards and get my phone replaced and all that. I was lucky enough that the, ca the gallery had insurance and ended up reimbursing me. A year goes by year and a half goes by, then I hear from the police. So they're telling me about this woman, and I figured, okay, that must be how she got the ID. This is the security camera of like the, the day that the wallet was stolen from, the, from camera work, and we never found out who it was or anything. But this woman's name was Erin Hart. The inspector gave me some information about identity theft. She, uh, they sent me a redacted copy of the report, and um, for those of you who don't know, redacted I don't know, it just wants to advance now for some reason. Um, uh, the redacted is when you have these like blanked out areas. Um, and then they sent me another duplicate that actually wasn't redacted, which was really awesome and how I was able to do the project. Um, so he sent me this redacted copy, um, my copy, and said, um, just in case, I'm gonna send you this copy. And before I could ask him anything, he hung up and I was like, wait, what? For what? Like, in case of what? Um, and, so, and he said good luck was the other thing, which I was a little worried about. So the week after this phone call in 2011 from the SFPD, I started getting bills, parking tickets, notices, um, and finally a summons to appear in court for an unspecified crime. Now, hopefully none of y'all have had the pleasure of receiving a summons with your name on it and having no clue where it came from. Oh, and I hope none of you have had one in general. But um, generally, when you get a summons to appear in court, you were there when the thing happened for which you are being summoned to appear in court. That did not happen to me at all. Um, I had no idea what the crime was. When I called the county clerk's office to ask about it, they obviously didn't believe me, of course, that I didn't know what it was. Um, and they were like, you're just going to have to go to your court date. And I said, but I live in New Mexico. And they said, well, then, you know, you're going to have a bench warrant issued for your arrest unless you have a lawyer show up or you show up. So I'm freaking out. Oh my God, I'm freaking out. So um, I don't, I have, I'm working these odd jobs at the time. I'm like trying to form my new identity in Albuquerque and not new identity, like my new name or anything, <laughs> not in like witness, witness protection, but just like a new life, like a sort of, uh, anyway. Um, I decided to go ahead and book a one-way ticket to Oakland. Um, I didn't know if I would have to go to jail. So that's why I didn't have the ticket back. Which is really like, I don't know if that, does that make sense? Like how intense that is? Because <laughs> for me, it was like, oh, I'm, I might go to jail for something I didn't do. And that's like right up there of one of my worst fears, that and being totally underprepared for something and not having enough, enough food, you know. <laughs> Those are things I really get concerned about. Um, so I showed up at the Alameda County Courthouse at 845 on April 15th, 2011, and I figured by appearing, at least I had a chance. So um, shortly after the judge looked over all this evidence, she immediately um, dismissed the charges in the interest of justice, and she specified identity. 
I was so relieved. But in that moment, I was also finally, you know, when you kind of go into like a survival mode about something, you're not really thinking too much about the other person. You're not really thinking too much about, sorry, um, spoilers, all spoilers. Um, let's see if I can pause it. Sorry. So I'm in crisis mode, and then finally the charges get dismissed, and it's like, oh, this big sigh of relief. I'm also now able to feel extreme anger, and the anger is directed to who? Aaron Hart, yeah, not me, Aaron Hart, the woman who stole my identity. So I walked out of the courthouse and immediately began my own investigation to find her, of course. Right? Um, I just wanted to know what she'd done with my ID. I wanted to find her, and I really just wanted to face-to-face -face be like, so... Did you at least like have fun or like did you like because she had rented all these cars she crashed one she like I mean she was living it up for six weeks under my name I really at least wanted to know was it worth it was it worth it for her um, you know with a little tinge of anger a little bit of like I'm gonna beat your ass you know but um, very quickly as I or slowly I should slowly over time as I learned more and more about her. And you can see her, right, and identify her in this picture. Um, I started by following this paper trail of the police report. I didn't know much about her, and the copy of her license I got with the report was really hard to identify, but I did have an address. So I went to that address, of course. Um, I had that one-way ticket. I hadn't booked a flight back yet. Might as well stay the weekend and try to hook up with this lady that stole my identity. Um, so I went to the address listed. I had no idea what I was going to say or what I was going to do, by the way. I had no plan. It was just about, like, let's find her. Oh, that's a great idea. That's like the dialogue that was in my the monologue. She must have just moved out because her name was still on the entry pad. And I just felt like I was kind of at a dead end at this point. Um, and I did go in and knock on her door. I have no idea, again, what I was going to say. She didn't answer. I was like, okay, I better just go back to Albuquerque now. <laughs> Game over, you know. Um, so after about nine months, I was able to, I really put a lot of time into clearing my name. And so that nine months, it took about nine months to clear my name. And Erin Hart, like I said, had only had my license for six weeks, but she did a lot of damage. So she, by the way, she didn't have any of my credit cards or my social security number, nothing. So if you ever lose your license or have it stolen, you need to, like, report that and have it canceled. Sorry, guys, I don't know why all of a sudden it started doing this. Um, still, during this time, I found myself wondering who she was, if she was in jail, what she'd done with my ID. And so over the course of two years, um, from 2011 to 2013, I flew back and forth between Albuquerque and San Francisco. And I came really close to finding her on my own, but I, it just, I, it just never, it never happened. So when this gallery, SF Camera Work, San Francisco Camera Work, offered to actually show the work, they were like, wait a minute. We had kind of an aha moment. You had your well, it's stolen from our gallery. Let's have a show of the work. And won't that be funny? And I'm like, yes, that's great. So um, I was like, great. So I have all these photographs I've been taking. Um, I'm happy to show them. They're like, no, no, no. Well, now you need to find her, though, for real. And I was like, shit, like, I don't know how to find her. I'm clearly not able to find her. So I, I did the thing that I felt like was the most logical thing. And I spent, um, I had gotten married. We had a little bit of money. Um, it was all of the money we had. And I sat down with my husband and I said, I shouldn't just spend our money on this PI, right? And he's like, no, you should do that. We should do that. Um, <laughs> he is also a conceptual artist. He's like way more social practice conceptual than I am. So I was like, okay, I, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 let's do it. Um, so I'm uh, pregnant at the time and um, we decide just to go for it. So um, I bit the bullet, so to speak, and spent all of my savings to hire this PI. Within a week, Pete um, was able to make a huge breakthrough. He had people on the inside. So he was former SFPD. I picked the right guy, by the way. He gave me a really good deal. Um, Aaron Hart was serving 10 months in jail, and part of the charges were for falsely presenting my ID to police. Um, Pete got me your mugshot finally. So this is like a huge breakthrough. Is like, whoa, I actually know what she looks like. And like, I don't know. I, the, uh, maybe, I don't know, she's a little older than me. I think she looks older than me. Just, <laughs> yes, she looks older than me. Um, and he got confirmation of the release date. So she was in jail, he got confirmation of the release date, and it just so happened to coincide with my spring break <laughs> from teaching. So I was like, spring break. <laughs> so this was my spring break. 
Um, and actually, I misspoke. I, I wasn't pregnant at the time. I actually had a nine-month-old. So my son was nine, month old, nine months old. I found someone to watch my son <laughs> while I went off. And um, yeah, I won't, I'll spare you all the details. But basically, I had the most exciting day of my life. Aside from getting married and having my baby, this was the most exciting day of my life. The stakeout started early and really slow, too slow. It was like not like Lenny Briscoe with donuts and then the action starts. It was like, okay, so I have to pee now, Pete. What am I supposed to do? He's like, hold it or go in the alley. You know, so it was like all these really great life learning experiences happening. Um, but I was really starting to get worried because it got to be towards noon and she still wasn't released and we didn't know what was going on. And this, we're in this tinted SUV with these three guys. So it's Pete, the main PI that I hired, and then two former Navy SEALs, Nate and Jarrell. And they're all armed to the teeth. Like, they have their Glocks, and they're comparing Glocks and, you know, all that, whatever. And they're like, and I remember Nate was like, so what did she do to you again? What's going, why are you doing this? And I was like, I'm an artist. And he was like, but why? Wait, I don't understand. I was like, Sophie Cal, have you ever heard of a conceptual? And he was like, no. I was like, revenge. He's like, oh, okay, I got I gotcha. <laughs> so it was a common language. So after waiting all morning, Erin Hart was finally released, which was thrilling. I finally could see her in person. I mean, I was down the block, like halfway, <laughs> but I could see her in person. And Pete was very clear with me. I was not to approach her. <laughs> So I really wanted to approach her, but I didn't. Um, but so Pete and I are in the tinted black SUV. Nate followed on foot and Jarrell trailed in the car. All a combination of images I took and they took. So it's a very big um, collaboration here. Uh, we followed her all over to a gas station, onto a bus, into a Goodwill. So Nate walks by me. He's like, she's stealing clothes. She's stealing clothes. Like as we're in the Goodwill, I had hopped out. I was right across the um, racks from her and slowly... I started, something changed for me. And so this is her, and I'm like right behind her with my iPhone. Because I can't like have a telephoto lens, you know, and be like, hi, you know, like, I didn't think she'd even recognize, I, I really doubted she even knew who I was. And um, I don't know, I started to see maybe like this vision of, could that have been me? I started to make up this like dramatic narrative of like me had I not gone to college, or like me had I, you know, I had definitely done things as a young person that I'm not proud of to this day to make, to survive, to do, to get through college, to get my degree, you know, and I kind of connected. I got it. I kind of got why maybe you would get to the point where you would steal someone's identity. I, I felt empathy for her. And I started to see the pursuit of her in this moment as a performance and less I was able to identify that's what was happening. I was performing, and I was also documenting my performing. And she was an unknowing, an unsuspecting collaborator. So before this art exhibition opened in fall 2014, several invitations were sent to her using an address. I myself physically confirmed to be her. So remember, Pete has like inside guys, um, her parole officer. <clears throat> uh, and so I knew where she lived. So I went there, and I waited, of course, naturally, for three days. And there she was. Came out, finally, boom, again. It's a, it's a lot of, like, coffees and a lot of peeing in alleys and a lot of just, like, a lot of nothing. And then there she is, and I identify. So I get out of the car. I run up to her, and she runs away from me. Why would she st stick around to find out who I was? So I at least knew she lived there. And I wasn't able, of course, to give her an invitation to the show. But I did put it in her door, you know come on over, check it out, see what I did. I don't know if she got it or not, but in all sincerity and naivete, probably, I did really hope that she would come to the exhibition. Um, I had a crew from This American Life there, like waiting if she showed up. I had some news people waiting to show up. I had this documentary crew of people that were trying to make a reality TV series, which is which are all the images of me, like the dramatic black and white images of me with like the mirror. You know, we were making this whole reality TV series thing happening. Anyway, um, I wrote this letter to her from my heart. I really wanted to reach her. And the entire piece, I realized, was meant to be a letter to her, that I was reaching out to her, that I wanted to know her. And as naive or crazy as that might sound, that was me and that was who I, I was and who I am. So she never showed up through the whole exhibition, though we did get some people who came by who claimed to know her. Um, 
My favorite was one that was like, she oh, still owes me like 30 bucks for this synthetic meth I sold her or whatever. <laughs> so there was stuff like that. And the gallery, like, the, you know, they're gallery people. They're like, oh, yeah, this guy, very colorful character came through, Jessamine. And I was like, mm-hmm. Um, so then something really unexpected happened for me. Um, my project was covered by a wide range of media internationally. Um, journalists and writers made multiple attempts to reach Erin Hart for comments, none of which she responded to. Um, she ignored, which I, I get, I understand, right? When you Google Erin Hart's name, let me put it this way, when you Google Erin Hart's name now, my name comes up, my story comes up. That was the empowerment, I think, that I was really seeking. Not necessarily revenge, which ended up, it sort of ended up being framed that way, but then I took hold of that and I was like, oh, hell no, this is not revenge. And I told my story in the way that I wanted it to be heard. And I corrected the Daily Mail UK and they made those changes. The editor made those changes and apologized. So I felt like I was onto something once I got this external validation for the story being, you know, wow. I didn't think it was that crazy, but I mean, I guess it's a little crazy. But this recognition, this public display of the, the piece, this changed the conceptual meaning for me. So in media interviews, I always want to be able to say that I feel resolved. I still get requests for interviews and things like that. And um, it usually is uh, like the same kind of questions every time. Like, did you really find it? Is this real? Everyone always wants to know, is this real? Yes, it's real. <laughs> like, um, believe me, this American life does not mess around with that kind of stuff. And I, I learned that very quickly. They're like, but is this real? And I kept kind of skirting that line of, well, maybe it's not real. Maybe this isn't. No, they needed to know, and they had fact checkers and you know all that. Um, same thing with the Today Show. They were not going to just have this sort of like cagey artist, like, I don't know, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. No, it happened. But they always want to know, are you at peace now? Did you learn something from this? Um, do you feel resolved? And I don't. I don't feel resolved, if I'm honest. Um, I'm left with many questions. They're still unanswered. I don't feel resolved where it's left off. I feel really proud of this publication. Um, I have a copy if you are interested in looking at the physical copy. I'm really proud of this publication that SF Camera Work put out. I'm really proud that as a photographer, I didn't have to pay for my first ever monograph. That's a really big deal. That the Andy Warhol Foundation saw it fit to pay for the entire project. So they ended up reimbursing me for all of the fees of the private investigator. That's a big deal in my world. That's a big deal in my field. It's a big deal to get this kind of recognition as a lecturer, as, as an educator. And so I really feel good about that. I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing that. But what I didn't feel great about is like, I don't still know who she is, right? And so, um, Recently, uh, her best friend from high school reached out to me, and we've been in a conversation over the past six months about doing a documentary film where we actually go and find her. It's not going to be like a whole like rehab, you know, or anything like that, but it's definitely, boom, I guess I'm done. Sorry, okay, I'm done talking. Um, but it's, It's really interesting because the people that came out of the woodwork initially were all people that were like, yeah, she wronged me, she did this, she did that. And then after uh, a while, people started coming out of the woodwork, I, I want to help her. I knew her when. She went to college. She grew up very wealthy in Palos Verdes, California. Um, and she's an addict. She's homeless. She lives in San Francisco. Her family refuses to talk to her. Um, I think that's really interesting. I think it's really interesting where I started and where she started and where our paths crossed, she chose that, right? Just, she chose that. But then what did I choose to do? That's really what my work and what I hope to continue to make work about is that what do I choose? What do you choose? So you lose everything or you, whatever happens to you, what do you then do in response to that is empowerment. That's how you empower yourself. Um, that's how I empower myself anyway. Um, so in my mind, it's up to me what I do with this. So, um, I'm, I did about 3,000 hours of private investigation work in connection with my project, The Rare and Heart. I, only, I, I need 6,000 total to become a full private investigator with a license in the state of New Mexico. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and become a private investigator. Um, and I'm currently doing uh, work for lawyers in town. And um, I do summons. I do, like, you know, serve, serve papers. And um, I don't dress like this when I do it. but. 
But um, basically, I want to just go there. I want to sort of what my gallery calls making the transition. I'm going to make the transition, and I'm going to actually become a private investigator. My studio is now being converted into a private investigation office. And I'm working on this documentary film where I'm hoping to tie that in. And then I'm also working with a screenwriter in LA on a full, um, the fictional adaptation of the story. That's it, any questions? <laughs> yes, so you sir. you never did actually confront her to talk to her. So I have to save something for the documentary film. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to be no, more direct, that's cool. That's cool. to be more direct though, um, no, I haven't met her face to face. I have seen her through the telephoto lens, um, but I, I do, I, I still contemplate that. I'm working towards that. Yeah, because there's a part of me too that's like, haven't I done enough? Like, can't I just leave her alone? No, <laughs> <laughs> clearly not. I want to like, I want to be her friend. It's awful. I don't. I really don't. Don't worry about me. I just, it's like that for me. It's like empathy goes there for me. And so I'm working on this idea in my work about boundaries and trust and things like that. Other questions? Practical ones or, yeah? Uh, well, I mean, just looking at this, part of me wants to say, like, you, like if I were in this situation, like, I want, like, revenge of it. Like, right. how do you, like, did that part of you just, did you just kind of, like, not really want, you just kind of wanted to I had that, yeah, um, I had that feeling, just sort of, sort of similar with my dad, like I wanted to take power, but you know, but for a second, and then being the person I am, um, I always just want to understand what's happening, so it's kind of a vulnerability, obviously, for me, and a lot of the relationships I have personally and professionally, I definitely, even if someone is coming at me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay, so what's going on? Why is this happening? You know, it's like, it's just a curiosity. It's like, I'm so interested in human nature and how uh, that works. And so I'm just, I'm fascinated by her. I am go not going to lie. There were times I was very scared for my safety when I got really close and when I was on my own. As long as I had the PIs with me, it was okay because they had their Glocks. But then I did go to a couple of times to her address to try to, um, you know, confront her, I guess. And I was scared. I was very scared. And then I had this whole fear that maybe she actually knew. Like, my big sort of weird hope slash fear is that she'll do, like, some sort of thing, retaliatory thing against me, you know. So it's complicated. I, I'm not going to say I, I didn't feel anger towards her, like I wanted to seek revenge, but that was not, that's just not who I am. That's just not, yeah. But a lot of people, and I tr I learned through this, don't read the comments, like online, is like the struggle is real. Don't read the comments. Um, and definitely not on Reddit. Um, <laughs> that shit is rough. Like, <laughs> this lady doesn't know what she's doing. What? She is stupid. I hope she gets shot. Like, all this crazy stuff. And I was like, oh, oh, oh shut it down. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Like, yeah. So, what other people would do is what other people would do. Yes. Sure. Um, what are you looking for them to get out of that? Wow. That sounds like me asking my students about their work. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I want to be clear. The fictional adaptation is just that. It's fiction. It's also a collaboration. I'm not a screenwriter, but i working with a screenwriter who approached me, um, and he wanted to write the whole thing, and I was like... I want to write it too. Um, so we're working together to figure out what that is. So I'm working on trusting him to know what sells and what will sell. And then um, he's working with me to understand like what the whole thing is about. Um, and in short, I would say it's sort of like this drama of um, finding oneself. So when I, I have this whole like beat sheet of like what the beats are, any of you who have uh, taken classes or know anything about writing a play or screenplay, it's like about those, the, the, the progression through the story, right? And so I'm learning a lot. Um, but in general, it's about this idea of overcoming something and taking ownership. And there's a lot of cool stuff in there that we're going to throw in that's not, you know, like 
that's not actually my life, so I'm psyched for that, you know, to inject fiction. It's kind of cool. Yeah. No ah, me too. We'll see. I mean, we'll write it. Who knows if it, someone will buy it or not. Um, anything else? Uh, yes? And then, yeah. Um, so I'm very close with my family, um, but we're geographically, geographically far away. So I live in Albuquerque, and um, although I make it back to New York a lot, I don't always end up being able to see them um, because it's usually the work is in New York in the city. But it's, it's hard um, to talk about, too, because my mom is actually very ill right now, um, and the past six months have been really, really difficult. I have not been back there in a year and a half, and that's the longest I've ever been not back there, but I am always in conversation with my sisters. We use um, Facebook messaging a lot. We use text messaging, um, and it always sort of works out that we're all sort of struggling with issues that we support each other and help each other in. So I feel like it's just kind of still like life is, you know, that's why I decided to end that project. Like it could go on forever, right? So when it finally felt like, okay, we're at a breaking point, um, but I do think a lot about going, going back. Um, they don't live on that farm anymore. They sold the land. My mom lives in a, a nursing home. Um, my sister has a master's in social work. My other sister is a home health care worker. My brother's a mason. Like, they're fine. Everyone's okay-ish. Um, you know. Life. Yeah, life. Uh, and then there was another question. Yeah. They are completely unedited, um, and I will say that's a really good point I wanted to bring up is that they're all shot on film. That first project, all film cameras, all film, and what you're seeing are seat prints, so they're actually analog seat prints, which I had really committed and specialized in and now no longer really exists, <laughs> but that's okay because that body exists, and um, it was really important to me that the images were raw and real and un. But like I described about the tableau idea, there are images that I took of myself in a setup situation, but that was based on something that really happened. If that answers your question, yeah. Uh -huh. Just the uh, very first image of your mom with the gun. How did that become your favorite image? Because obviously you felt like it was about like Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know. I just knew it's my mom. Like, and I think for that one, she's in the most powerful position um, that I've ever seen her in. This is how I like to think of her. Um, it's personal, but what I love about it is that it bridges from that meaning that I possess to a more general public understanding and meaning. And I think this image stands really well on its own, um, apart from the project and apart from me and apart from her, um, which scares me a little bit sometimes because I wonder, like, well, could the NRA, like, take it and use it for something? You know, like, but I also really believe strongly that when you, as an artist, put work out there into the community, into the world, that it is part of public, you know, understanding and cultural understanding. You hope, right? I mean, that's what we would hope for as artists, I think. So um, I try to embrace that it's got this sort of accessible quality to it while remaining extremely personal to me. Just really love the socks, like that they're these like, you know, she's such like a, she's a strong woman. She's a very strong woman in a really like weak, messed up body. And I, I like to remind myself of that when I fe don't feel like getting up to go for my run, you know? It's got that for me. Other, uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, yeah, in reference to this project also, you talk a lot about um, using the project as understanding and reflection on your own identity, and I'm just curious what your family's response was to these images. Did they gained any understanding or reflection on their own? That's a great question. Um, that I could answer in like an hour, but <laughs> no, no. But the short, but the short answer of it is, um, we have a great relationship because I made these images. Um, for me, I feel that way. For them, the, and if you watch the video that's in there, you see my sister and I have this tension at a certain moment where I'm like, "Oh, did someone forget to turn the toilet off? And now it's overflowing. There's shit everywhere. Oh, what's going on?" And they're all sitting, and she's just like, 
Yes, Jessie. You know, and she just had this attitude because she's a teenager, and I've got a video camera in her face while our toilet is overflowing. So, I mean, there was conflict about me making these images. There were images I took while I was screaming obscenities. My mom's screaming obscenities were like brutally fighting, and I'm taking photographs, and they're telling me to put the camera down, and I'm not. Um, it became a coping mechanism, and they got that at a certain point. Um, I think it, there was a turning point when it became that I won that award, and then it was like this work was public, that my sisters were like, okay, so you're just, you're doing this, so okay, <laughs> we're on board. <laughs> um, and I, I really uh, feel super privileged for that. Like, they're my collaborators. I think of them as my collaborators. All right, well, thank you so much for being such a great audience, and I'm here for questions.